Um, for over a year now, we've given you our opinions about the world, about politics, about media, about culture. And the entire time, we thought we were unimpeachably right. But we have come across someone that's changed our perspective. It's fair it's to true. say. Yeah. Very true. I'd like to start by begin by introducing a new a new character to the Chapo canon that, you know, I came across this morning. Well, I've known about him for a while, but he was really distinguishing himself this morning, so I want to talk about him. And then our new character is the Dark Professor. Of course, I'm talking about uh, Toronto-based psychologist Jordan B. Peterson. You might be some say that someone who is incapable of cruelty is a higher moral being than someone who is capable of cruelty. And I would say, and this follows Jung as well, that that's incorrect and it's dangerously incorrect because if you are not capable of cruelty, you are absolutely a victim to anyone who is. And so part of the reason that people go watch anti-heroes and villains is because there's a part of them crying out for the incorporation of the monster within them, which is what gives them strength of character and self-respect because it's impossible to respect yourself until you grow teeth. Uh, yes, my influences are, uh, well, you know, sorry to uh, overload you with my influences, <laughs> but uh, they include Immanuel Kant, Victor Frankl, Darkwing Duck, and Louis Armstrong. <laughs> I think to myself, what a logical world. I see ads of hominem at absurdum too. Just wow. because someone posts a swastika doesn't mean that they hate Jews. <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. Making fun uh, yeah. of his uh, Kermit the Frog f from uh, Ontario voice. <laughs> Very, very logical. You're definitely responding to his arguments that way. You're not so proving him right at all. People who are mean in the comments are doing you a favor. They're telling you everything about them or nothing about you. <laughs> so uh, Jordan Peterson, I mean, like, he's a guy who basically, he, he got internet famous and became the, the professor of... Uh, the alt-right and, like, logic pedants online because he refused to comply with the University of Toronto's pronoun policy. That, 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 that's basically Yeah, he's right? the Rosa Parks of pronouns, basically. Yeah, he, he, he would not refer to people by their preferred pronouns uh, only by the gender they were born or something like that. And and then he he gave a series of... I don't know, he's, like, sort of... He, he's, like, one of these, like... Uh, sort of like philosophy logic nerds that have now found an audience with uh, sort of incel, shut-in Pepe yeah. guys. I think Peterson is sort of an interesting character. I think he's funny because he is so intensely self-serious. And I, tr I was like, I tried to watch a video of him being interviewed by Dave Rubin. And obviously... And, and, and your browser was like, warning, <laughs> IQ is too high. <laughs> Collective IQ of this video is too high. I, try, I tried watching it and then I was like skipping around because it was so fucking boring. But like the one segment of it I watched, Jordan Peterson was uh, telling Dave that uh, Frozen is not as good a movie as Beauty and the Beast because it has politics and that nobody will be watching Frozen in 30 years unlike Beauty and the Beast, which is a timeless classic. <laughs> Today, young men are taught to take all the negative aspects of the beast. They are locked away in their mansion and berated with messages, but they don't have any of the benefits of his life. They don't have a candle that they can sing songs <laughs> with. <laughs> I, I, I just like, like I said, he's been sort of a, a character on my radar for a while that seemed like a, he'd be a, a, a ripe for an amusing uh, discussion on the show, but uh, this morning when I woke up, he had really distinguished himself because uh, he's now sort of uh, taking up the cause of James Damore, uh, that, that yeah. fucking freak-faced grotesque. <laughs> that absolute and, <laughs> dipshit. <laughs> and his, his, his lawsuit against Google for dis you know, discriminating against him for being a white man and having uh, logical beliefs. Yeah, for, for they, just, they, they, yeah they, he's, too, he's Mr. Too Damn Logical. They too, had to fire him. Yeah, they, he, he is like a, he's just a poster boy for the Dunning-Kruger effect, this guy. He's amazing. He had a tweet after he got Web famous for his his uh, Evo psych, yeah his Evo psych Google memo that got him fired where he says like a bird a, a country needs two wings a right and a left wing if one is too uh, 
if one is too powerful, then it becomes unbalanced and it can't fly. Well, that's and like, dude, you know that that is a figure of speech, right? <laughs> like, I mean, that's such a basic logical error that it kind of calls into question his entire claim to being the king of logic. Uh gonna call you on that one. Uh, countries are exactly like birds. <laughs> birds are immortal. Issue their own currency. Uh, represent millions of people. <laughs> And yeah, no, I mean, whenever you start, hey, the word for word thing was society is like a bird. And <laughs> it's You start out that strong. I'm with you. Yeah. So he was uh, going to bat for, for James Damore and uh, the sort of this. He, he, pr- he proposed an experiment for people to do. And I'm just going to read from him right now. Peterson says, Google image search bikini, then do the same with Bing and then think hard about Google's desire to shape our perceptions themselves in the politically correct manner regarding James Damore and his lawsuit. And it's just like... What? So, so, so like, like, okay, so then people did the search on Google and Bing and basically both return, as you might expect, images of women in bikinis. And like, from, as best I can tell, if I can intuit sort of trying, what he's trying to say is that the Google results maybe showed women who were of a you know not you know sort of plus size the, so or, i saw one person do it and the only difference was there were a couple of pictures of ashley graham who is a quote-unquote plus size swimsuit model who has been on the cover of sports illustrated yeah i mean she's hot and you know as as a very forward-thinking man like yeah um Maybe I will fuck a woman without exposed hip bones. <laughs> that's, that's but very, I'm a pro Google oh, SJ. I thought it, yeah, I, but you're I, a soy boy though. That's why. Was I'm, just, all, I'm, virtu- I'm virtual. I'm virtue busting. <laughs> <laughs> or is it like Google was showing more like non-white women or something like that? And that's results? not true. Yeah. I didn't see that. It, I think it's really just that there are a few shots of Ashley Graham in the Google one. That was the so difference. like, but other than that, the results were pretty it's much just, identical. Yeah, it's women in bikinis. So then people started pointing this out and then like people started replying to the people who were like, I don't get what these two image searches are supposed to prove about how we're being sort of nudged by Google's politically correct algorithm or something. And then like his, the people who were I guess fans of Peterson or like defending this position were like, okay, Google uh, European painting and then they can Google and then, or, you know, like, or um, like American inventor and you'll see what we're talking about. And then what happens is, is if you Google those, ter- those specific terms, like if you European painting, you'll see a lot of results of like the same one or two paintings of like a portrait of like a, a like a Moorish person mm-hmm. or something like that. And then, like, American Inventor, you'll just see a lot of, like, black inventors. Aha! Like, aha! But then if you actually, like, click through to, like, what the, why the results are coming up, you'll see that the reason that these are the top results is because, like, it's all the results specifically of alt-right people searching this term and getting angry, and they all link back to their own blogs and fucking <laughs> things about how... European painting is now to means black people or something like that. Wow, not since Benny Johnson. I'll, it's amazing how these people keep getting owned by predictive algorithms that are all tied into their own fucking searching. I want to put a put a little flag in this. Um, Jordan Peterson first came across this because he was Google image searching bikini. Yeah. Like that's how he jacks <laughs> off. <laughs> is, is, is he's like, all right, it's been a long, hard day of logic. Uh, why don't I, uh, you know what, Jordan, you've earned yourself a reward. Uh, how about a woman in her bra? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh! I think that uh, you know what? No, you deserve bikini. <laughs> like he, he jacks off like me when I was like nine and I couldn't yeah. come yet, and I was just like, oh, how do I see boobs? Oh wait, sorry, this is it. Uh, Jordan Peterson followed it up and he said, "Just how exactly is this done?" Image search Google European people art. You know that well known phrase that, people <laughs> that is used yeah, to describe totally art. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then like and then what it, then when you get European people art, all you get is a bunch of alt right memes about <laughs> Donald Trump and black people. Um, <laughs> and he's like, This is very interesting what's being done to our perceptions. I don't know. Anybody who says that he's the king 
dick of logic and thinks that a company like Google gives a shit about anything other than making fucking money is just full of absolute baloney, my friend. Yeah, I love the idea of these soulless androids at Google and the Google Playpen Mega Mega Dome or wherever <laughs> they work, like in their in their personalized ball pits inside their <laughs> cubicles, are like, all right, today we're gonna we're going to fool people into jacking off into. <laughs> WOC, and we're uh, every time they look for you know that classic term that everyone searches for art by Haplo Group. <laughs> we're actually going to show them Hotep art of Jesus being black and say it's from the Renaissance, and then that way, like, what do they accomplish? Yeah, what's the meaning of that? Yeah, these guys who, who go around their offices in like a giant hamster ball with a twelve-hour Soylent suppository. And like twelve every f- couple hours, they get a teenager's blood infused into their dicks. They they really care about about yeah people jacking off to uh, to a, a plus size model. Well, you know what's interesting about like, this I is, just, is just, that like <laughs> for both types of right wingers, they have to believe that STEM lords are just the most brilliant people alive. And if you're like a Ruby like a Rubio Republican or like a, or more libertarian t- twinged, you're like. Oh, they're going to save the economy. They're liber- literally going to fix all the problems. They shouldn't be taxed at all. We should give them every every visa program for foreign slave labor to fix everything. This is the most exciting thing. Nothing is overvalued. But if you're like more alt righty, it's like no, yeah, they are amazing. But they're using it to ruin the world by uh, making me jack off to a woman with dreads. I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 once again it's over and over you see the phenomenon of people being alienated rightly from these massively powerful and totally unaccountable corporate entities but then just losing the thread and then like allowing sort of pre-existing uh the like their own pre-existing resentments to sort of shape their analysis of what's wrong with the company. Well, yeah, here- it's like how Birchers were against the Vietnam War, not because it was a stupid and brutal and thuggish entanglement, but because they're like, oh, no, we should just nuke all of East Asia. That's what I've always thought. Here's an interesting question, though, at least as regards like the, the James Damore loss. Uh, and, you know, we all know what we think of him. I mean, if, Genius. Your, fa- if your face looks like that, you shouldn't. Be shouldn't have Google could fire him based on that alone. Yeah, because I, he should and, be and camming then, with that bod. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but like the, okay, so like the obvious hypocrisy here is that like when these logic nerds come face to face with like the you know running into the thresher of like real corporate power, uh, then they all get like up in arms about like oh my freedom of speech, even though that like usually nine times out of ten they're political ideology tends to afford corporations. The yeah, their whole premise is that they, is a, an owner of a company should have complete control over what happens within it, including who's employed <laughs> and why. However, like, you know, like the, the flip side to that, though, is us, you know, cheering Google for firing a employee for sharing a, yeah. his personal thoughts on a company email or something like that. And it's like, you know, the line here is, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer because on the one side, you can say, yeah, like it's of course it's Twitter's right to to ban you know Nazis or people who you know th- threaten people with death or went on so so on and so forth. And then like when people get banned, the rejoinder is obviously, well, ha ha, you sign the terms of service, and Twitter's a private company; they can do what you what they want. However, the internet is now such that like three or four corporations basically do control all yeah. speech on the internet. Yeah. And should they be treated like a public good? Should they just be nationalized? Right. And if they are nationalized, then every anything that would happen would be subject to strict first. Nathan Robinson wrote a piece about this today that I thought was very good. And it's and it is hard to say like where you know where that line should be drawn between public and private because it's let's say if if, if you were effectively banned from Facebook, Google, Twitter. Apple or whatever, you know, like, like I said, these three companies, then like, yeah, your speech has been diminished yes. and your ability to participate in the public sphere yeah. is being abridged by private companies. Right. Yeah. So like, is that a first amendment issue? It, I, I absolutely think it is. And I think that I, I do think it's funny that these, these, these guys who, who preach social Darwinism and, 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 and a totally unregulated economy think yes, but the internet should be, uh, should be a public good because i got banned from fucking twitter because that's how they think they think in these very they think only about how things affect them personally so the only companies that 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 could possibly infringe upon their rights even though they're that's not supposed to happen even though private companies are supposed to be the guarantors of freedom 
the only way that they can the only ones that are bad for me it's not you know it, it's only the ones that personally fucked with me it's the only one that made me not be able to post my goiper memes on fucking twitter <laughs> and it's just it's another example of how like this isn't this is it's it's an easy hypocrisy to point out on either side. The yeah. people who, who laugh at Google doing this, the people who are outraged. And, but the way to fucking to resolve that contradiction is, yes, through taking that logic of nationalizing and, and extending it outward into all of these companies that have the power to completely fuck people over and are unaccountable and injecting accountability into it through a public, uh, a public ownership. By the way, I was... Uh if you Google, if you Google image search like an actual term like nineteenth century European art or anything specific, like you will of course get the results that you that you know these people would be thinking of. It's just like yeah, if you search the, fr- the, the if you search the phrases awkward, these freaks phrase, use yeah. in their awful yeah. memes and blog posts, yeah, then you will find those results, right? Yeah. And I just I, I love I, I love the thought of Jordan Peterson being like. I was uh, using my computer every time I, I searched Kierkegaard because I care about Western civilization and philosophy in my research. The, as soon as I type K, the first letter, that I'm sent to something called kink.com. <laughs> and I just can't stop looking at it. It's, it's just the, the postmodern degeneracy. It does no bounds. I, was I don't have time for divine bitches. I'm trying to find out about fear and loathing. So, like I said, I went down a bit of a Jordan Peterson. Uh, I went in Jordan Peterson's hole. Today <laughs> you went in his oh, b hole. Yeah, yeah uh, in the b like hole. Like Han Solo. <laughs> yeah. And uh, someone pointed out this meeting that not too long ago. I mean, this is of note to our show. I mean, we we are founders of the Jared Fogel Innocence <laughs> Project. Would it shock you to learn that Jordan B. Peterson is now? Sandusky Innocent Curious? Yes. Hell yes. Hell yes. I'm John Ziegler is like, welcome to the fucking resistance, That's friend. the real resistance. Yes. And then, uh, so he, he, he was, <laughs> yesterday he was retweeting someone uh, who was, like, you, like, if you just like keep opening these quote tweets, they get weirder and weirder. And it starts with Peterson going, God, could this be true? The repressed, recovered mem- memory industry is an ethical morass, which is true. Yeah, but that's the, not what convicted Jerry Sandusky. Exa- yes, exactly. The, Jordan Peterson, the assistant literally, coach, literally walked in on yes. him fucking a boy. Yes, uh, uh, he literally thinks that they just grabbed like thirty adults and like got Bella Lugosi to dangle a pocket watch <laughs> in front of them. You're remembering what Jerry Sandusky did. And okay, so so Jordan Peterson there is is quote tweeting someone named Diana Davison who says Mark Pendergrass is the journalist really breaking the story on this wrongful conviction of Jerry Sandusky <laughs> and it links to something called thecrimereport.org and then she's <laughs> quoting another person named Dr. Oren Amate who goes holy shite Although I strongly disagree with some of Cruz's statements, interpretations, and claims, especially regarding the Holocaust, his piece on, <laughs> <laughs> his piece on, his piece on, on hashtag Jerry Sandusky is a must-read, and it's in Skeptic <laughs> Magazine. Oh, can you count to six million accusers of Jerry Sandusky? <laughs> Sorry, back to Peterson. I just uh, Matt, uh, as one of the conditions for your losing yes. the. Uh, Losing the poop touching bet, the Roy Moore bet. Uh, you, you know, I said I was going to punish you, you know, physically and mentally. You've done the physical test touching the cat poop. Now I'll put you through the mental test. Yes. And I just want to let put the marker down for all the listeners. I have ordered you a copy of Jordan Peterson's book that is now. It is not out. It is not out yet. It's coming out on the twenty third. But I have pre ordered you a copy, and I feel a little bad for juicing this fucking nitwits uh, book sales, but I think it's in service of a good cause. I, we might find out that he's actually the logic genius that he claims to be. Well, so I've got an open mind. Well, here, well, here's a preview. Uh, Peterson has, is sort of, he heretofore has been written like very academic books about like, you know, religion and mythology and things like that. Um, but he's cashing in on his newfound like internet success being a kind of, you know, the, the the sort of the dad for the alt right, you yeah. know, for a lot of sad Pepe online guys, and he's got an, his book is called Twelve Rules for Life: An Antidote to Chaos. <laughs> and I just want to read a little bit from the uh, sales copy here, and he says here, um, humorous, surprising, and informative. Doctor Peterson tells us why skateboarding boys and girls must be left alone. What? what terrible fate awaits those who criticize too easily 
and why you should always pet a cat when you meet one on the street. What? So right off the bat, I got to say, I agree with two out of those three things. Skateboarding boys and girls should be left alone. If I, I Presumably he means by mall security or just, you know, uh, people shaking their fists <laughs> yeah. at them, you know. Uh, terrible, f- uh, criticizing people too easily. I mean, that's our bread and butter. I don't like to imagine a terrible fate awaits us. Well, also, that's the thing of like, well, what does that mean too easily? I mean, come on. Obviously, that's, it's, it's, it's a meaningless phrase because you haven't defined the term. And why you should always pet a cat when you meet one on the street? Folks, how about you pick it up and bring it inside your apartment and live with it? That's what I believe in. That's a good recipe I, for I'm feline a, AIDS. I'm a living testament to Jordan Peterson's beliefs, okay? So it goes on, he says, what does the nervous system of the lowly lobster have to tell us about standing up straight with our shoulders back and about what? success in life? Why did ancient Egyptians worship the capacity to pay careful attention as the highest of gods? What dreadful paths do people who tread when they become resentful, arrogant, and vengeful? Dr. Peterson journeys broadly, discussing discipline, freedom, adventure, and responsibility, distilling, distilling the world's wisdom into 12 practical and profound <laughs> rules for wisdom. life. 12 rules for life shatters the modern commonplaces of science, faith, and human nature while transforming and ennobling the mind and spirit of its readers. Sh- shattering all of your preconceived notions by telling you to stand up straight. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that this, this is kind of like an NRX life hacker type yeah. thing. Yeah. It's like, um, yeah, yeah. And then like I was... SJW Media will yeah. tell you to walk <laughs> in the style of the virgin. Uh, can we just play a clip of him where he's like crying and shit on yeah, stage? Of course where, we where, can. Where he, where he just... Because we've been doing the, the, the voice and I don't think you guys are uh, really getting the full effect it's you hear from the dark the dark the dark knight himself you know i'm sorry that we've been talking like this the whole time and you haven't even gotten a chance to hear him and it makes me think of all the people who will never hear his voice and it makes me very emotional even real ones cry <laughs> i've gone around and spoken and a large proportion of my audience has been young men young you know under 30 something like that And I've spoken to them a lot about responsibility. And what's so odd about about this is that of all the things that I've spoken about, because I can see the audience and I can feel how the audience is reacting, because I'm always paying attention to all of you insofar as I can manage that. So I, I, I get some sense of how what I'm saying is landing, you know, which you have to do if you're going to speak effectively to people. And what what happens is if I talk about responsibility, is everyone be is Silent, just like they are now. Silent and, and not moving, right? Focusing, attentive. Say, pick up your responsibility. Pick up the heaviest thing you can and carry it. And the room goes quiet and everybody's eyes open. And I think, that always makes me break up. I was... Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your service. <laughs> By the way, uh, the... The, the the sort of playlist that you two another another algorithm that's that's nudging us in a, a politically correct direction. When you search uh, Jordan Peterson, I'm just looking, just browsing uh, some of the Jordan Peterson videos on offer. Uh, Jordan Peterson on the meaning of life for men must watch Jordan Peterson. Don't be the nice guy. Jordan Peterson handling your darkest feelings. <laughs> Jordan Peterson is life worth the suffering. And finally, Jordan Peterson advice for hyper intellectual people. <laughs> Settle down, dorks. <laughs> oh man! So uh, yeah, look look forward to our coming review of uh, the Twelve Rules for Living. We'll let you know what all twelve of them are. Not cannot just wait. Standing up straight. Uh, by the way, Matt, uh, it is like five hundred pages. Oh so. fuck! <laughs> oh, God damn it! Uh, that's what you got get. Him. That's what you get for doubting the people of Alabama. <laughs> okay, uh, let, let, let's get down to business here. Let's get down to the twelve rules for life. If you listen to the show, we've talked about Jordan Peterson before. I'm sure you're familiar with him. I don't think he needs much introduction. Can I just say there was an article in the L.A. Times recently uh, about him that that talked about him as being because you guys you know he's the dark professor yeah but he has been referred to as a member of what this article called the intellectual dark web yes did you see this this? yes this is like uh i think it's dave rubin has self-christened him sam harris jordan peterson and i don't know fucking uh 
McGruff, Darkwing Duck, Weinstein, Dong, yeah. Yeah. Darkwing Duck, or something. Yeah. Wait, Harvey know. Weinstein's on the intellectual <laughs> dark web. Absolutely. Wow, yeah. it really is dark. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hate it when the FBI. Frank from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. The thing is, I, I don't know if these guys know that the dark web is where like you download child porn and hire <laughs> hitmen and like they're <laughs> identifying their like yeah. intellectual movement with it. I'm glad you brought that up. The intellectual dark web, right? Like, and 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 you know. Uh, Mo and you or all these guys but like Peterson in particular I think is the perfect avatar of this because it's like yeah. ooh this, this, his, he's dark and dangerous like these, these, these controversial ideas he's putting out there ooh like he's just too dark and intelligent the, the fundamental fact about him overall but all of these guys is how unbearably tedious and vacuous their actual thoughts and writing are. Okay, let me Far tell you. Far from being uh, dangerous, it's just, it's only dangerous if you're trying to fucking stay awake or make sense <laughs> of any of it. I did, I did read the book, and let me tell you, it is basically a combination of, like, uh, The Secret and The Bell Curve. It's like, <laughs> it's like if, you, if you're in the market for some self-help bullshit with all the kind of narcissism and navel gazing and mysticism that implies but there wasn't enough social darwinism in it for you <laughs> this is the book for you don't just respect yourself have contempt for others <laughs> perfect oh, that's combo contribution it makes oh that's that's what i believe in yeah. um so to start things off like my, my the main thing i was curious uh, about this book it's like a it's a it's a tome it's a doorstop this thing and it's it's a genuine, you know, hit in the, in the publishing. Yeah, world, it was number know? one on Amazon for a while. Yeah, the well, reviews were raves. I think it, it's a unanimously our... five star rated book. Mm -hmm. Except, I wrote a review that was one star uh, that I asked people like if they if they found it helpful to upvote it, and for like a couple of hours, it was the the second most helpful review on there. It said, "My man has literally no idea what he's talking about." And you were a confirmed purchaser. You weren't just. I was a confirmed purchaser. The, uh... I read the book, and uh, the Jordan Peterson fans mounted a campaign to get it taken down. So yeah. Wow. Okay. Can't handle What happened free in the speech? marketplace of ideas? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's Safe the other space, thing. My friends. Is, uh, uh, you know, I mean, of course, he is like all these people um, embraced and taken up the mantle of uh, free speech and the you know open uh, exchange of ideas and civil society. But um, both him and his fans are just about the most. Uh, thin-skinned uh, dorks and reactionaries yeah. imaginable who, again, like if you make fun of Peterson or even just discuss him in any way that uh, short of absolute reverence will throw a fit and, uh, you know, again, just take you on the road to pedantry. The speech thing is something they get really, you know, outrageously pedantic about because, like, he, he he's famous because... He said he wouldn't call trans students by their preferred pronouns. Mm -hmm. And like every time he's pressed on that, he says, I didn't say that. I said I wouldn't call them by any pronouns that were dictated by law. So like what the fuck are you going to call them? Like, I mean, he's totally uh, willing to obfuscate what he's actually going to say in service of some abstraction. Well, that's a very good, I mean, this is sort of like uh, his ruse, and I think it, it speaks to a lot to his popularity. And I, like, for instance, in all of these interview clips of his that have sort of gone viral, I'm sure you've seen them, he genuinely does get the better of the people who are interviewing him most of the time because yeah. they're largely unprepared and they have, they do the standard sort of liberal thing where they're like, you don't really believe this, do you? I mean, we've talked about this before. And then he does a thing where he just speaks really belligerently and quickly and it, it just sort of like plows right over them. He however, in like words about statistics that like most people don't know. However, what like what he does is like there was a like a, a famous one, the, the one that a lot of people shared. It's like uh, I think Vice was interviewing him and he was talking about like, you know, sexual harassment in the workplace. And he was making the point that uh, lipstick, when a woman wears lipstick, the point of lipstick and makeup in general in women to like sort of, you know, brighten, redden the cheeks and lips is uh, to convey sexual arousal. It's meant like they, like they, to convey a sort of exaggerated sexual response. So he's saying like when women put on makeup and, you know, dress up to go to work, they are signaling their sexuality in a way. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't lie to ourselves about what's going on there. And then like the interviewer would be like, We'll just try to pick like, well, so what does that imply? And he's like, well, I'm not implying anything. I'm just really acknowledging that. But it's just like he's setting up these sort of like thought experiments and statements that would seem to imply that uh, women are asking to be uh, have their asses pinched just because they wear makeup to work. But 
one could just as easily say, like, when a man wears a suit, like a, a blazer tailored jacket is supposed to make your shoulders look wider and give your upper body a sort of nice sense of symmetry and proportion, which is also sexual signaling. So, I mean, I wasn't going to say anything, Will, but your outfit proves it. <laughs> I mean, I'm dressed like a fucking the, slob the, right your, now. The sweatpants yeah. and the <laughs> yeah. slippers. When, when you wear track pants, you're daring people to look at the outline of your dick <laughs> the same way that it goes in the jungle. Uh, d- just simply, simply, what does the man wear when he comes to the podcast? He puts on a pair of sweatpants where you see exactly how he's been circumcised. <laughs> this kind of gets at his appeal, though, is because he's talking about these taboo subjects, you know, like, and and it's exciting for some of his fans that, like, he's talking about the the sexuality that's, like, lying behind seemingly normal situations. Mm-hmm. And they get excited about that, and but they get, just accept whatever but like, like but mumbo again, jumbo in, he has in a, in a very add. vague general sense. Yeah, like, yeah. of course that's true, but it's just like, what is he implying here? And the thing is, I don't think he really knows what he's trying to imply. I think his fans like pick up on these little cues that uh, resonate with them because it's like exciting and controversial. But I think he very strenuously tries to avoid the implications of any of this because like i said I, I think he's just incredibly tedious it's just like when you're when you're a kid and like you have a substitute teacher who like uses mild swear words and you're like wow this guy's cool he said what the hell you're like that's basically uh how these guys are responding to him is this kind of like paternal authority figure who's a little on the edge well for like a lot of reactionaries in the past like few years i'd say you can really rip shit up and like get an audience by pointing out how shitty the modern world is it's fucking terrible like most people that listen to you aren't happy they're completely unfulfilled by their existences they have no fulfilling relationships in their life but for most of them like for a lot of the alt-right guys it's like they'll string them along and be like hey doesn't mark zuckerberg suck doesn't this suck isn't it fucking stupid that uh the only avenue of politics is like this sort of cultural consumption in which Marvel movie you see. Isn't this fucking stupid and tawdry? Don't you hate your life? And then they sort of like lose people because every time they all meet up, they look stupid and kill somebody. (laughs) Or you talk to them long enough, they're like, and the thing that we do about it is we blow up a Home Depot parking lot. (laughs) But with Jordan Peterson, it's that he just goes into this sort of Sam Harris uh sort of so Evo psych bullshit. And it's not it's not that it's not that his fans are like super interested in what he has to say after he points out how shitty modern life is it's just that you know it, it sounds like something that's smart and they're mostly hooked by like yeah well, my th- life is shitty i think what what hooks them also is it's one it's step one is you identify discontent and that is where a lot of these small less successful reactionary quote-unquote thinkers stall out is because at, they really only have a, a spurious diagnosis he has an action item and it is just self help. It's just yeah. mm-hmm. it's just take control of your life, Bucko, because the life of a sort of underemployed, relatively economically stable middle class young person is one with basically no supervision, no structure, and that allows you to basically do a thing like game until you wet yourself. Because no one will stop you from doing that in le- except for yourself. And he is acknowledging that and saying you have to be the one to actually intervene in your own life. And that is, that's incredibly powerful, either because people literally don't get parented anymore, like parents don't talk to kid, their children about, about these kind of things, or people grow up so wedded to the, the rhetoric and communication styles of the Internet that nothing is real until they see it online. So their par- their parents can tell them to clean their room all week, and it's just going to go <laughs> over their head. But when their YouTube friends tell them to clean their room, it actually resonates. I'm not sure which it is. I'm not one of these guys. So there was that uh, the most famous interview he did was uh, the one on the BBC with Kathy Newman, and there was that part when I think she said something about how like, well, you know, most uh, Fortune 500 CEOs are men. It's very exclusionary. There aren't a lot of women on there. And he said something like, well, yeah most men aren't fortune 500 CEOs either. And like, that's true. And if you're not going to be able to like offer a critique of a a structure that has extremely wealthy people and extremely, uh, you know, disadvantaged people, you're going to get caught in places like that. Yeah. Well, that's that's why why he seems so, 
you know, like he's the reasonable one. That's know? why he's not going to go away is because the other. So like, yeah, there are two main like dominant cultural forces, like the reactionary one and the liberal one. The liberal one can't point to the world, the culture it's created and go, uh, actually, you love it. It's great. <laughs> they just can't. America is already great. So, dude, Jordan Peterson is going to be around like forever until I don't know. He starts a cult or he he finally does like uh he intersects a mass suicide with Haley's Comet at the right time. I don't know. But, yeah, he's not going away because they have no answer to him. Because, because he offers a structural critique. And it's wrong, but it is, and it's, it's gibberish at its heart, but it is one that seeks to offer an explanation. And, there, and all cultural con- conversation on the, bro- on the mainstream is not comprehensive. You, it's just individual think pieces, right, and individual reactions to specific discrete events and all coming from this sort of vague cultural liberalism and, and, and w- which really just is, has nothing to offer other than the status quo is basically good. We could use some more diversity, but nothing that actually r- speaks to anyone's real discontent on any level other than like – not seeing enough representation and in I think, art or something. And I think what Peterson does is, like you said, we, we, we hooks him because, like, uh, we hook, he hooks the, the marks, as we've described earlier, but I think, and then what he, what he offers is this kind of Jungian psychoanalytical thing, trick, where it's just like you can, with this knowledge that I'm going to impart to you, you can recreate yourself as sort of a character in your own heroic narrative yeah. it, 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 that, that connects with these subconscious, ancient, sort of almost biological truths yes. about humanity. And this is where it gets into the reactionary part is because all of these truths that, you know, Peterson thinks is unchanging, absolutely true, and any attempt to alter or go outside of them will lead to disaster are all things like, you know, uh, just hierarchy is natural. Right. The traditional family is natural, and like like these are like we need to hew to these things that are all true because they've been true throughout all of human civilization. This is something that actually like he uh, feuded with Sam Harris about because you know Sam Harris's fans all like requested that he get Jordan Peterson on his podcast. You know, like want well, my two dads to talk, my my Islamophobic dad, my transphobic dad. And uh, so he he went on and he just said a bunch of gibberish about archetypes and the collective unconscious. And Sam Harris was like, what the fuck are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. And everyone was disappointed. And they had this email exchange where Peterson was like talking about slaying dragons and shit. Yeah, yeah. He really loves... He loves the slaying the dragon. Well, thing. that's the thing. Is and, that and, and I these sort of, guys, like the Paris fans, liking Peterson, how many, I want to know, what percentage of these Peterson fans are guys who, until Peterson showed up, would have considered themselves guys who like, were loved logic and reason and thought that those were the ways that you figure out the world. And then this guy shows up with the dragons and the fucking subconscious and this Yuki and stuff. Yeah. And they're like, fuck me up, buddy. And it, <laughs> it, what it shows is that what they really don't, they don't really care about logic or reason. Yeah. These are just a totem because they want to justify traditional hierarchies because they think they belong on the top of them. They think they aren't on the top because uh, evil cultural Marxists have interceded with, with the truth, changed the culture, undermined their rightful place, and they want to get back on the rightful place. The same way that like the ancient regime before the French Revolution was was had a natural order. They feel the same way, but the 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 Enlightenment came along, cut all those heads off, and we don't think in terms of divine rule anymore. So we need something to replace the divine right with, and it can only be in a modern context. So it's got to be reason and logic. But if another guy comes along and he has the same hierarchy to defend, and but he does a more a, a, a more sparkling job of it, and he's talking about dragons and archetypes. I'll take that. Whatever it is, whatever can justify the hierarchy is what matters. Uh, Matt, you know who else had a natural order? Lobsters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <clears throat> I want to get into this now because, like, the book is called Twelve Rules for Life," and ever since it came out, it's like all I want to know: what are the twelve rules? I've actually found someone who who just has done all twelve. I rules. forgot all of them. Okay. I'm hoping your life since, must since, be fucked up, man. Since you read your house the book. is burning down, your house would still be yeah, up there shit. if you followed them. <laughs> rule, <laughs> rule number one: never finish a bottle of water. 
If you have water out in your home, if there's a fire, you can put it out quickly. This is a, this is a real quote from Peterson's first book, uh, Maps of Meaning. <laughs> Chaos. That's my favorite Halo combat of all <laughs> Do the voice, Will. Chaos is what extends eternally and without limit beyond the boundaries of all states, all ideas, and all disciplines. It's the foreigner, the stranger, the member of another gang, the rustle in the bushes, the hidden anger of your mother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then he goes, okay, order, order. Uh, no, he goes, chaos is symbolically associated with the feminine. Order, by contrast, is explored territory. That's the hundreds of millions of years of hierarchy of place, position, and authority. That's the structure of society. And this is, again, all this dragon bullshit. Well, so I'm just going to say here, chaos is the fire that burns down Shuja's house. That's Order right. is the Porg and Virgil's. And the water, yeah. <laughs> Listen, here's the way he puts that in the new book, uh, which which is full of like that that type of stuff about you know the, the balance of order and chaos in the world. Uh, he says, order and chaos are the yang and yin of the famous Taoist symbol. <laughs> Two serpents head to tail. Order is the white masculine serpent. Chaos, its black feminine counterpart. <laughs> what? Now, what? Well, what I, serpents? Oh. Are, <laughs> I don't. You, I don't think you've got to be a Freudian to look at <laughs> white masculine serpent. And draw some kind of conclusion about oh, yeah. what he's motivated. This is, oh, yeah, this is logical and reasonable. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. This is a ro- this is logic. <laughs> this by, is reason. By the way, check out my new website, whited.com. <laughs> <laughs> new collaboration with Jordan Peterson. Well, We're logical men. Look at look at the okay, black women Shuja, of chaos. Have you seen this? Look at the fucking diagrams oh, that I've are in him. his first book. It's like literally Henry. The fucking yeah, it's Henry right Darger. Darger. It's Henry Darger <laughs> yeah. shit. This is like the diary of a madman, where it's just like you're just like linking all these things. This circle represents the kingdom of order. This circle represents the dragon of chaos. Between it is masculine and female truth, belief, energies. It's like <laughs> that's. Re- oh, yeah. oh, I are, fucking love logic and reason. These are, these are like this those, is the enlightenment. These are like those Hotep memes where it's like sex. Sex, spirituality, energy exchange. <laughs> yeah. It's like two people fucking, but they're writing books on each other. This motherfucker <laughs> claims that he is defending the lo- the Enlightenment tradition with this shit. He keeps saying that they're, that the cultural neo Marxists are undermining the Enlightenment, and this is what he, this is what he is calling the Enlightenment is this insane gibberish from his head. About about the the chaotic female. Uh, I don't know if he could find vagina. the Enlightenment. Like, no. I, I, he has no idea what these philosophical schools that he's constantly referring to no. actually are, who was part of them, what they what they represent. Uh, the Enlightenment was, you know, I've only I've never studied modern European history, only watch YouTube. The Enlightenment was a time when uh, all the guys of Europe, all our old friends, you know, George Washington, uh, uh, Francis Epic Bacon, all of them got together <laughs> And they said, why don't we have an exchange of free speech and logic called YouTube, <laughs> which has been around for 300 years? Well, what it was, what the Enlightenment was, was people using logic and reason and, and an observable reality to challenge an unjust hierarchy, the, the society of order, and saying that this, doesn't, this shouldn't exist. And being answered by, no, it's always been, and God has ordained it. And now this guy, under the guise of that Enlightenment, because it is such a penetrating and powerful idea that has persisted in the West for the, the, since its inception, he's going to use that term to defend that same fucking hierarchy, and he's just replaced, you know, Hobbes' uh, divine, uh, you know, constituated go- uh, god king with a serpent sucking its own dick. Uh, I just want to I I include this part. Uh, shout out to uh, Nathan Robinson, who did a great uh, takedown of Peterson recently in This Week in Current Affairs. Uh, this is amazing, though. In, uh, in Peterson's first book, he includes an epigraph that is a letter to his father. And I'm just going to read this here. I don't know, Dad, but I think I've discovered something that no one else has any idea about. And I'm not sure I can do it justice. Its scope is so broad. Okay, you know how <laughs> often you jerk off with your right hand? What if you put your left hand <laughs> upside down? I sat I sat on my hand and it was like I didn't know it. It was like it was a stranger. 
<laughs> it was chaos. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, its scope is so broad that I can see only parts of it clearly at one time, and it is exceedingly difficult to set down comprehensively in writing. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> Anyways, I'm glad you and mom are doing well. Thank you for doing my income tax returns. <laughs> oh, cut the- Income taxes are easy, you professor bitch. Now I'm, I didn't used to give a shit about was, this guy. Now I'm mad. I was going to say, I have some rules for you. You have to keep, you don't do online banking. It's easier than any time in human history to keep track of your expenses, bucko. Felix, I was, when, I, when I read his letter to his dad, like, this struck me as sort of like a miniaturized version of the 8,000 page Nausgaard novel, yeah, uh, where it's just a letter to my father. This guy, he's such a poor man's Nausgaard. <laughs> Nausgaard, Nausgaard um, his book about cleaning his room, that's just one book in a 50, 50 volume entry about his first 12 years on the That planet. letter honestly sounded like an excerpt from Confederacy of Dunstan. Yeah. <laughs> that's some yeah, 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 Jay yeah. Riley shit. I'm on the edge of something, mother. Father, I'm on the edge of something. It's, I can't even comprehend it. I'm edging, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I keep talking about the rules. I want to know. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. All I want right, to go right. through these. Da, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> new rule. Okay. These are, Peter, these, are, these are Jordan Peterson's 12 new rules to fight the chaos. Fight the, fight the chaos, which he has said is female. He is telling his legion of incel <laughs> dork fans that women are terrifying other that must be tamed. But that's oh, logic and reason. Homeboy. That's not a, a fucking graph that he made with human shit on the side of a wall. You can tell from lipstick. Yep. No, but you homeboy, home, you need to put your finger on and above the G spot, play the clip like a swizzle stick flute, and you need to give chaos a triple digit orgasm. Matt, now, now you say that, that like he's, he's representing, the, the feminine represents like the dark bottomless abyss of chaos and me, men represent the light of reason and order. And you would say, well, that's a fairly misogynist, like pseudo philosophical drivel. And then I think he would say, he would point out that, no, you misunderstand me. I'm saying we need order and chaos. But he wants it's to about, fight it, though. It's about the synthesis. It says of fight, both. though. <laughs> well, let's fight. hear these rules, he's, man. He's not saying synthesize the chaos. <laughs> well, fight know, the chaos. Sometimes, sometimes. The word is fight. That, that <laughs> fucking uh, Marcus Lapon guy, he knew okay. how to fight the chaos. All right. So I keep delaying this. Here are the 12 rules. Rule number one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. Okay, Shuji, can you can you do you remember this and can you explain this one? Okay, for one thing, the role model he wants you to emulate when you stand up straight with your shoulders back is literally lobsters. Yeah, uh, this is, the, don't the, do, this is don't. a famous. This is his famous. But they mascot. don't have. Le- they don't it's stand not up at all. Like Paul Bunyan or you're something. Pedantic, but they don't. But they don't stand up you're, though. You're being pedantic. No, they, he, they don't have okay, legs listen, as we would I, imagine. I, them. I I actually I've. I've bookmarked a uh, 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 an excerpt in my dog-eared copy of the book here uh, where he talks about the lobsters that I can just read to you what he says. Yep. Yes, please share. Okay, lobsters have more in common with you than you might think, <laughs> particularly when you are feeling crabby. Ha ha. Lobster. That's not, that is not a pun. You. That sucks so bad. <laughs> They're not even. That's not even the right animal. Uh, oh. Lobsters that's live. Terrible. <laughs> lobsters live on the ocean floor. Just they like need, you. They need a home base down there, a range within which they hunt for prey and scavenge around for stray edible bits and pieces of Just whatever like rains me. down from the continual chaos of carnage and death far above. Is this That's, about Virgil's sounds, apartment again? <laughs> that they, right. want, they want somewhere secure where the hunting and gathering is good. They want a home. So this, this can, is a debate. This is the basement when your mom is hucking uh, beef right, jerky down. You're just down trying to play you. video games yeah. and the carnage of mom and dad upstairs. Yeah, order and uh, chaos in, in, fighting in each other. I hate when order and room. chaos fight yeah. each other. Why? I have to why spend is dad wrestling I, mom? I have, to, I have to spend weekends with order. It kind of sucks. <laughs> Yo, hold on, this guy's well, actually I, a genius because you know what they call lobster cages. Bedrooms. Oh, shit. really? Yes. Why do they Damn. call? Them? All right. Well, listen. Yeah. This can present a problem since there are many lobsters. What if two of them occupy the same territory at the bottom of the ocean at the same time and both want to live there? What if there are hundreds of lobsters all trying to make a living and raise a family a in the same what? crowded patch? He's thinking of SpongeBob. Yeah, I'm He's, a, yeah, look, I, yeah. man loves cartoons. He's just He's got, doing SpongeBob. Yeah, yeah. Fucking lobster goes to work every day. Yeah. Clocks in, clocks out. All right. Other creatures have this problem, too. When songbirds come north in the spring, for example, they engage in ferocious territorial disputes. The songs they sing, so peaceful and beautiful to human ears, 
are siren calls and cries of domination. A brilliantly musical <laughs> bird Herzog. is a small warrior proclaiming his sovereignty. I'm so sick of these birds that only sing about bitches and hoes. <laughs> So listen, what happens next in the book is that he tells this story about uh, how when he was a kid, he got a tape recorder and he made a recording of a songbird and then he played it back to the songbird and the songbird attacked him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, listen. Like fucking Kez. Oh my okay. God. So then he, then he brings it back around. Now, wrens and lobsters are very different. Lobsters do not fly, sing, or perch in trees. Whoa, uh, whoa citation whoa. needed, motherfucker. No, I'm sorry, Suja, Suja, we have, we, we have to censor this guy. This is too dangerous. <laughs> this is more important than the First Amendment. We've got to stop this book from being read. Wrens have feathers, not hard shells. Wrens can't breathe underwater and are seldom I've served. I've tried to make them! <laughs> 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 and they are seldom served with butter. However, they are also <laughs> similar in important ways. Both are obsessed with status and position, for example, like a great many creatures. The Norwegian zoologist and comparative psychologist, and I can't say this guy's fucking name, observed Just call back- him Nausgaard. Yeah, it's Nausgaard. Every man, Carl, every Carl man in Norway is Nausgaard, yeah. As Carl Knausgaard said back in 1921, even common barnyard chickens establish a pecking order. Listen. The determination of who is who in the chicken world has important implications for each individual bird's survival, particularly in times of scarcity. The birds that always have priority to access to whatever food is sprinkled out in the yard in the morning are the celebrity chickens. After them come the second stringers, the haggers on, and the wannabes. Then the third-rate chickens have their turn, and so on, down to the bedraggled, partially feathered, and badly pecked wretches who occupy the lowest, untouchable stratum of the chicken hierarchy. Those guys are such Man, like, where do the lobsters go? What the fuck? Okay, what he's doing here is he's employing... Uh, He's having a stroke. He, he, he's, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget when chaos, I mean mother, stopped me from testing wrens breathing underwater. This is, this is postmodernism. Yeah, okay. What he's doing here with, with all the lobster and chicken shit is what, what he's doing is he's saying in nature there are these fairly ruthless hierarchies uh, that govern you know, who passes on their genes and is sorted out largely through you know, violence and domination and things like that. And he's extrapolating from that that like essentially that is the natural way of things and a human society, you know, like you should be like the victorious lobster because he, the lobster gets physically bigger and struts about when he has cleared his little lobster warren. For this month. is kind of a downer of a point, but like his lowest stratum of chicken society, he literally calls untouchables, yeah, which are like literally a cast of yes. people in India yeah. who are severely oppressed. Well, they have Spanish. it coming. He's, again, they, they got outpecked, bedraggled, and partially yeah. feathered. Well, I, I, again, I mean, like, but but if you, the, the, even the, if you want to pick fucking birds, there's just a, a new study out about how ravens survive through a very complicated system of cooperation rewards based a, a rewards system based on cooperating with one the another. The thing is, Matt, we shouldn't even have to talk about the fucking birds, really. You know. Yes, like, because we're human beings. Just, yeah. <laughs> because we're social animals that fucking have the power of speech and have created civilizations. But again, like this works because it's true in a very banal sense that, you know, all animal species, including Homo sapiens, are, you know, they, they, they are governed by these kind of like nasty, you know, un, un irrational, darker impulses. And we sort ourselves into these pecking orders in human nature. However, the fallacy is that like that that's because it exists, that it's good and human and human civilization or society is inalterable and as that a result. Inevitable, of it. And yeah. that's inevitable. And that's inevitable. Right. And again, of course, you could do the opposite and pick out any number of animal behaviors that are completely alien from human beings and be like, oh, we should emulate that as well. Yeah. We you should know? be like bonobos and just stick our dicks in each other's faces whenever we have a conflict. <laughs> so that. OK, so that's basically the point he's making about lobsters is that like you got po- to be alpha confident, posture. you got to you got to have alpha posture. Alpha posture. And sort of project Don't let confidence. anybody take your space on the ocean floor. And if somebody plays back a recording of you, your face <laughs> attack that. <laughs> Fucker. And but he was when he's saying stand up straight with your shoulders back, he means like you know as a young man, like uh, the the more defeated you are psychologically, like you will reflect that physically and sort of like close your body language up and sort of hunch over. And if you just sort of projected more physical confidence, you would feel more confident. Generally. See, and the does, thing does is, he, that's true. Yeah, and that's a perfect example of his whole deal. He has an actually useful, if kind of obvious, <laughs> piece of advice for you know you're slumped over basement dweller that might not even have thought about posture before this 
and he smuggles into it a bunch of insane social Darwinism. At the same time. That's the formula. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, does he do like a version of the uh, Virgin and Chad meme but with like a bunch of insane circles all over <laughs> it? <It's> like, <laughs> Mother chaos. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The Chad is order. Rule number two. Treat yourself like you would someone you are responsible for helping. Okay, I mean that's just nice, you know. That's yeah. just like a that's like a, a you know a good attitude to have. Yeah, that's like self care. Uh, this that's is just... this is yeah. This is like the guys who like who like they turn thirty five and they're like, oh my god, I did thirty two hits of acid, and I realized that when you're nice to people, they'll be nice to you. <laughs> oh my god, it was like God was talking to me. I mean, the thing is, he's he's a he's a psychologist, so he does like you know do therapy with people. So, you know, half of what he says is just really basic ways for people not to hate themselves and hate their lives. And he's just like, let me just throw some uh, what is, is he smug- racism in there. <laughs> All right. Rule number three, make friends with people who want the best for you. That's like literally your friends. That kind of is a defining character. Okay, I, 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 he has- I, I, I will only befriend people who want to see me die. It always keeps me on my toes, keeps me ready. But what, yo, what yo, else yo. is a friend if not nah, a person? Nah, yo, I keep my circle small, yo. Only yeah. eat with a few, laugh uh, with many. Yo, fuck, yo, fuck, fuck, <laughs> fuck G Jack. I want to see the Peterson versus Amiri King. Amiri King. King. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Don't make friends with anybody. Yeah. Friends are for yeah. bitches. I'm not even friends with my fucking wife. <laughs> I'm not friends with myself. <laughs> There's a there's an anecdote he tells in here uh, at that part about how he like a childhood friend of his came over to his house and he brought a friend of his. Oh, I heard about this. Yeah. It, OK, he says it was his friend. I really remember he was spaced. He was baked. He was stoned out of his gourd. His head and our nice civilized apartment up on goofballs. did not occupy did not easily occupy the same universe. And then, yeah, he just goes on about how uh, pissed off he was that this guy was in his apartment. And then he takes his friend aside and says, you need to leave and take this useless bastard with you (laughs) or something like that. So this is his attitude towards friendship. No, no stoners in my house. (laughs) Okay. Rule number four. Compare yourself with who you were yesterday, not with who someone else is today. So that's sort of like he, he he's getting into this uh, eat, pray, love. Yeah, well, no, I mean, I think I might see my- that's fine. Like, I mean, you know, it's fine to say, like, don't beat yourself up by comparing yourself to others. But he he's he's spins that out into this extreme individualism. Right. That not only should you not compare yourself to others, you should cut yourself off from others. You should, you know, uh, kind of elevate yourself above others. Like the first chapter. Wow, I, I can't. Why would young white men who've been conditioned to think that because they know a lot of things about Star Wars and are good at video games, are the natural rulers of the earth, why would they would appreciate someone telling them that they should cultivate a delusional sense of self-superiority that doesn't have to come into unseemly contact with other humans that might disabuse them of it? Again, this rule here is just like very basic, like boring uh, you know, life advice. However, I can imagine where he's going to go with this is extrapolating it to the political sphere, which is like, I think I've read him say things like, you know, uh, socialism is not about loving the poor, it's about hating the rich. And that like, it's this idea that it's envy that makes people, you know, advocate for a more just society or a more adequate uh, distribution of resources. Yeah, he's constantly saying like, don't blame capitalism, don't blame society. Well, you know, what should you even... uh, uh, What, blame Frozen? Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 that's exactly. the thing. It's like yeah. you don't want to blame. It's like okay, capitalism isn't the problem. To then fill the space of well, okay, how come everything sucks so bad? With well, a bunch of uh, a bunch of French postmodernists got together and changed the content of Disney movies. Yeah, it's a yes, reflection, yes. It's a reflection of like the most uh, kind of foundational neoconservative uh, neoliberal idea uh, that there is no society, as yeah. Margaret Thatcher put it. Like he he's uh, calling on you not to even consider yourself as belonging to a community. You're a lobster on the bottom of the well, ocean. I, yeah, I think I think Matt, you made the the absolute correct observation here is that like he's he's critiquing 
the sort of activists and people who want to change the world. And this gets into rule number six. I'm going to skip ahead one because I want to talk about it. He says, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. And I think the point you get exactly right is he's like, don't criticize capitalism. Don't criticize, you know, injustice. Criticize um, cartoons that aren't as good as they used to be. Yeah. Like that really is what he's interested in. The new in. Laura Croft's tits aren't big enough. <laughs> so, but the set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Again, there's like a half truth there that I think is applicable or even a okay criticism of the left. Like, you know, maybe sort your own shit out before you try to take on all the problems of the world. But when he says, set your house in perfect order, and then he will say that, of course, people are always imperfect, so then never try. Yeah. So it's this constantly receding horizon of things that you can or shouldn't do. And he says, I, I read something about him where he said, like, uh, the 60s were really bad because they just gave everyone the idea that, like, if you carried a placard, like, you should have something to say, even though you've never been financially independent and you're only a student or whatever. And my answer to that is, like, you know, how much small business experience should I have to have before I can say the Vietnam War was a fucking atrocity? <laughs> like, or that segregation is bad and should be confronted I mean, uh, criticizing someone else's house isn't the only thing you can do. You can also help people set their house in order. Some people don't have a house. You know, the, the, the only way he can think about it is we're in these autonomous spheres and we can be critical of each other. Yeah, that's all we can do. We yeah. can't build solidarity. It doesn't exist. Okay. I'm going back one rule now. Rule number five yeah. is do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. <laughs> this is actually my favorite rule. Yeah. Do you, you remember what that was about? Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not a parent, so I don't have a personal relationship to this idea, but how to, like, uh, raise your kids. Isn't this and, the chapter where he fantasized about beating up a small child at a playground? Oh, yeah. He has a story about how he was at a playground and there was an obnoxious child who was causing a shenanigans and he had a fantasy of like kicking the shit out of the kid and and then thought i i wish i could do that and since i can't this kid's going to grow up to be <laughs> okay. an there's ass. This, yeah, I, I, right. I have yeah. I, I have the excerpt right yeah. here he says i remember taking my daughter to the playground once when she was about 2 she was playing on the monkey bars hanging in midair a particularly provocative little monster of about the same age was standing above her on the two same bar old. she was two gripping i watched him move towards her our eyes locked he slowly and deliberately stepped on her hands with increasing force over and over as he stared me down. Well, he's being dominant. <laughs> he's being dominant. That's an alpha move. Standing up That's an alpha move. Yeah, yeah. what what's wrong with that? He's, she's in the space that he's supposed to occupy. That's his part of the ocean floor. That's the ocean floor. He's being a lobster. You should high five his little <laughs> second. I just love the idea that they locked eyes and he's being stared <laughs> down by a two-year-old. <laughs> and he goes... um, uh, he goes, um, he knew exactly what he was doing. Up yours, daddy O. That was his philosophy. Oh, his like, philosophy. Two years old, two years old, <laughs> also, don't have a philosophy. Can I just say, what is it with his, his like rockabilly slang? <laughs> yeah, this is a good, yeah. This two is, year oh, olds do not have philosophy. <laughs> they don't even have bowel control. He had already concluded that adults were contemptible and that he could safely defy them. Again, he hasn't concluded anything. Yeah, you don't have not, thoughts. He has two years like old. a three-word vocabulary. <laughs> he, I love that this two-year-old has like done the calculation and be like, I, I think it's pretty safe that I could defy these adults yeah. around me. I, I, very little will happen to me as yeah, a result. I, I never, I've weighed the consequences. He stepped on the face. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Peterson, uh, let's uh, have a discussion about uh, the nature of myth. He steps on her fingers and looks at him and goes... You're witnessing a great becoming. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, um, uh, he already concluded that adults are contemptible and that he could safely defy them. Too bad, then, that he was destined to become one. That was the hopeless future. Yeah, his bitch, you're going to grow <laughs> up. Got your ass. <laughs> that was the hopeless future his parents had saddled him with. What, to, to grow up? In two years. <laughs> I, 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 give, I give my child anti-aging anti -aging serum. They've been two years old for three decades. <laughs> to his great and salutary shock, I picked him bodily off the playground structure and threw him 30 feet down the field. <laughs> Wait, I, I think... Wait, he just punted this kid. Yes, well, he's, a he's fantasizing. <laughs> okay, about it. okay, fantasizing. which is totally normal and cool. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I didn't. Oh, he goes. No, I didn't. I just took my daughter somewhere else. But it would have been better for him if I had. Oh, it would have yeah, been better yeah, yeah, like yeah. killing him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It would have been. You know better what? I was murdered. a little piece of shit who had no all contempt for humans until a stranger in a public park <laughs> threw me across a playground. <laughs> 
And then my life was great after that. How many life stories include a violent inner interaction with an adult when you're a small child and then things just getting great from that, that point? That, that two-year-old was the dragon and Peterson was uh, St. Uh, George. George. Yeah. Yeah. And when a baby was also disrespectful and Peterson just used his thumb to press down on the soft spot on the top of his head <laughs> like a fucking <laughs> like a like a video game he was also uh conquering chaos he was about the size of a cooper and i just jumped on his head and the, the coins of honor and discipline came out of his body and i gotta, I gotta right. play ground power One thing i remember about this chapter is there's a section called discipline and punish which is literally the name of yeah. michelle Foucault's his, ba- his, his, book, his beth noir which i think he doesn't like, he probably doesn't even know that well he hates Foucault. Foucault, right? Yeah, he hates Foucault and Derrida, who he says are Marxists and who he believes what? essentially controlled the uh, the the way the whole world uh, uh, proceeded after the 1960s. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Is a cabal of French postmodern theorists with a combined income of like uh, what sixty five thousand francs a year, who wrote books most undergraduates don't even read when yeah. they get assigned them. Yeah. It's yeah. like you want to fucking talk about Matt. logic and reason. <laughs> What is a more plausible explanation for the course of matches of, through a screwdriver of civilization yeah. <laughs> of the last 30 years? The vagaries of global capitalism, i.e. the forces that control the production of everything that we consume and interact with. Yeah, or a handful of French assholes going to some colleges that most people don't go to, changing the content of Disney films and turning us all into... Uh, these horrible the thing is, not, not, dude, he didn't make up this theory either like it comes from like uh, these neoconservative think tanks uh, who blamed cultural Marxists this is like the Frankfurt, the Frankfurt School, School theory right when they said cultural Marxists they meant Jews, Jews. but you know they had this whole conspiracy theory about how uh, Marxism got turned into identity politics which then took over the world Jonathan Chait believes this yes he does. Uh, yeah. among other people and Peterson just adds, adds this thing where he turns Marxism into postmodernism even though most Marxists will tell you they hate postmodernism and people who, uh, I don't know a single person who calls himself a postmodernist, yeah. but people who are into contemporary theory are often very antagonistic towards Marxism. Yeah. And, and people who try what, to reconcile them yeah, are few Marx got between. driven out of the academy 30 fucking years ago. You can't get a Marxist interpretation of anything. Uh, but what, what, the reason that this is even surface level plausible to people is because the neoliberal turn happened simultaneously with the liberation of minorities and women in the West. And those two things sort of, one of them kind of cloaked the other one. And so people can point to the problem and say, well, look what happened once we got rid of these hierarchies, as opposed to look what happened when, you know, the uh, Western capitalism went into prolonged crisis and it was restructured in a way that radically uh, destroyed labor power and atomized uh, communities and deindustrialized and, and scattered everybody to the fucking four winds and turned yeah. them into uh, eternally precarious subjects who who's, uh, had no real economic security, no ability to pass on long term uh, security to their children. That, that is masked by the fact that, well, yeah, but now there's more women uh, in movies and black people on TV. Well, a lot of this is coming from uh, people in the center, uh, the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton, rewriting that history to the point that, like, you know, uh, the, the Black Panther Party was a think tank, hmm. you know, like they, they, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're turning these very radical movements uh, against racism, uh, for feminism, for, uh, you know, sexual liberation into just kind of, you know, uh, electoral policy driven, uh, you know, uh, democratic goals. The Black, Black Panther Party is not a think tank, it is a movie studio putting out some amazing films that we're all very proud of right now. Henry, Henry, I want a list of every fucking Jew that works at Pixar. <laughs> <laughs> All the Incredibles are Jews. They changed their name when they got to Ellis Island. Um, uh, he would actually like no, the, the Incredibles. Incredibles. Oh, Incredibles I'm sure he loves, yeah, yeah. He lo- I'm sure he loves Randy, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the movie yeah. he really hates is Frozen. Hates Frozen. He hates Frozen. Oh, Has anyone here seen Frozen? No. I have not seen Frozen. Oh, Chris, Chris you've seen, seen Frozen? Frozen? Okay. Is I, it what, what Marxist about, uh, propaganda? Oh, well, what he hates about... Post-structuralist, right? It's what? But he hate, he hates it because it's sort of like a revisionist fairy tale in that like the message of the movie is that like the princess doesn't need a prince to to save her or become self actualized or something. Yeah, there's that fucking song about how there is nothing outside the text and gender is constructed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Well, that's the funny thing is that he's like, yeah, this is this is a this is a departure from the classic tradition of these ancient folk tales, but it's a Hans Christian Andersen thing as much as Silver <laughs> right, right. He, he, he doesn't just know gets, that. He gets so much shit just plain wrong. Yeah. Historical facts, sources, citations. I mean, academically, the guy is a is a total uh, charlatan. Yeah. Okay, let's uh let's do rule number seven and rule number eight. I'm just gonna go through these pretty quickly. All right. Rule number seven, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Whatever. Okay, okay good luck <laughs> yeah. with that. All right. Rule number eight. We've oh. all we've all wrapped up that finding meaning thing in a bow. We can do that. <laughs> rule number Check eight that off. <laughs> rule number eight, tell the truth. Or at least don't lie. Un- all right. Okay. Again, like I mean just cool. the again, all these right. are like just incredibly pompous ways of restating like incredibly bland, you know boring yeah. truisms. Um, okay, rule number nine. Assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. That is something he does not do. <laughs> no. That is something I've never seen him do. Yeah, yeah, it's full contempt for anybody who is not on the same on board with this. And his fucking fans now are in this thing where they think he's such a goddamn genius. And I'm honestly convinced that it's mostly because we don't teach humanities to kids anymore. This is the first time they're encountering this stuff. Like, I think that they, I think a large percentage of his fans, they think he came up with all this archetype shit. Like, they don't know who <laughs> Carl Jung is. You know, they don't even know Joseph Campbell. So they think that he is just like, I, got, I went in my room for a while. And when I came out, I had these charts like Doc Brown and Dad, the capacity. Dad, I've got an idea. Yeah, you know, and they, they don't realize that he's just regurgitating this sort of this like this relatively uh, well trod territory yeah. of 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 uh, m- frankly discredited psychological concepts. Uh, rule <clears throat> rule number ten: Be precise in your speech. Now, this is the rule that uh, Mr. Peterson probably could use to bone up on. That's the thing is is that like uh, he has this rule: be precise in your speech. But every time you're critical of of anything he says, his fans are like, "Well, you gotta watch uh, you know uh, uh, ten thousand hours right, of his videos before they're now in a situation before you can legitimately where they think he's him. such a fucking genius that anybody who has a critique that they can't answer." They assume, well, it's in there. It's in one of the things he has said because he has the whole corpus of knowledge. So it's your responsibility <laughs> if you're going to criticize him to engage all of it. You're not. You're not. You're not qualified to talk about him unless you have absorbed his entire. And you know what? I'm sorry if it's transparent gibberish. What kind of what of violence am I doing to myself to 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 subject myself to something? There was this video that was making the rounds the other day online of uh, him summarizing a scene from Pinocchio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the scene was literally one minute long, and he yeah. spent two minutes summarizing yeah. it. Yeah. Well, that's what I love about like the the mythic archetype stuff because at the end of the day, I think really what he's interested in is cartoons. <laughs> that's what he loves talking about cartoons. Well, yeah, and, he's he is, and reading meat, and these are his maps of meaning. He's a cartoons. canon pedant. Yeah, that's all he is. He has an idea of what a fairy tale is that he thinks is is eternal and truthful, very logical and reasonable stuff. <laughs> and he thinks anything that comports to it is good, and anything that goes away from it is bad. Anything that goes away from it is doing so because it has a political agenda that is not truly artistic. The only way to be truly artistic is to replicate the same fucking tropes that have existed for a thousand. I, there's another video where he's just listing Disney movies, and he goes. Rudy and the Beast, great. They they really nailed it. Uh, Little Mermaid, nailed it. Lion King, uh, some problems, but nailed it. And, and <laughs> I wonder what like, the problems he's, he's were. Def- he's grading them basically on how they conform to his idea of the this canonical fairy tale he, motif. So he's just a fucking he's just a canon nerd. At the Cal- end of the day. Kalu is an awful little child who I would headshot. With no second thoughts, I'd head I agree Cowley. with you, Mr. Peters. Yeah. He's like uh, he's like Greg Turkington's character on On Cinema. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he just loves it. Like, you know, uh, you know, uh, Hercules, surprisingly underrated. Five bags of popcorn. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Shrek, lots of great things in there for adults and kids. <laughs> okay, here's a. Uh, this is great. Speaking of cartoons, he has he has a take on The Simpsons. This was again. Right, we've, been, th- we've been having fun, but I swear to <laughs> fucking God, let's get dude. Serious yeah, this for a is second. some serious shit. Let's I don't serious. give a fuck about this fucking is, God. Is, Nathan Ro- I care about the fucking Simpsons. <laughs> Nathan Robinson picked this uh, corn kernel out of the shit pile, so shout outs to him again. This is this is his take on uh, the Simpsons. 
without Nelson, king of the bullies, the, the school... He was not king of the fucking bullies! <laughs> All right. right, now I'm Jim mad. I've never true. really given a Nelson, shit about this guy. Now I'm mad. <laughs> Nelson is clearly a several rungs below Dolph Kearney and Dolph Jimbo. Dolph Kearney and Jimbo are the trail. Those Dr. tall ships really lifted the nation's now, spirits now after Watergate. Now we're Water being Day. the pedants now. Yeah, we're being Do- the Dr. Peterson, stuff. there is only one reactionary respect. His name is John Schwartzwelder. You will stop butchering his work. <laughs> okay, here he goes. Without Nelson, king of the bullies, the school would be overrun by res- the resentful, touchy millhouses, the narcissistic, intellectual Martin princes, soft, chocolate-gorging German children, <laughs> and infantile Ralph Wiggum. Muntz is a corrective. So his point there is that bullying the weak is like, that's like another order chaos order. symbiosis. It keeps order. Sort of Yin and yang, works man. Out. Yeah. Yeah. White masculine serpent. <laughs> it's like, so those things all have, those, all, those people, those, those children all have bad, bad things about them. Mm-hmm. But the bad thing of being a sadist is nothing compared to being chocolate gorge or intellectual. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh yeah. Well, how does Jordan Peterson feel about the real life, uh, real life chocolate gorging German child Kim dot com? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last two rules here. These are these are actually to me the ones I'm most interested in because I I can't figure out what they mean. <laughs> Rule number eleven: Do not bother children when they are skateboarding. Now this is a rule. That taken at face value, I 100% agree with. I you yeah. don't think don't. I think kids should be allowed to skateboard whatever the fuck they want. I perform citizens arrests of children <laughs> who skateboard all the time. I do think it's a crime. Uh, this I is lived, a really rambling, incoherent chapter. I don't know. I, yeah. I lived for a while. I lived in an apartment building, and there was a fountain in front, and kids would do grinds off of it, uh-huh. and it was really annoyingly loud. Uh, yeah. like Old it. man Christmas. Yeah. Here we go. This is the chapter where he goes in, all in on uh, postmodernism, and I completely can't remember. What does that remember. have to do with kids I cannot remember what it has to do with skateboarding at all. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so kids should be allowed. I, I think kids need more, a little bit more freedom, a little less supervision, a little bit more danger in everyday American life. That's generally yeah, sure. what I believe. Uh, rule 12. This is the final rule. And again, one that on face value I agree with entirely. Pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. Get Parvo. I got allergies, man. We can't what, do what, it. What is he saying with this? Is, is, does he literally mean pet every cat you see? It's just, uh, you know, it's just stop and smell the roses cliches. It's not, okay. you know, yeah. it's... All right. Stop and smell yeah. the cats. Stop, yeah. you know, <laughs> sniff the cat's asshole. Yeah, you, you, when you see your friends, you know, taking off their shoes, suck, take some time, suck their toes, you know? <laughs> just enjoy life. So those are the 12 rules. And I guess just to, to wrap it up here. Did you guys see the uh, weird update to Jordan Peterson and the thing going on with his daughter and him give, having COVID and everything? How are you going to talk about uh, like slaying the dragon and raise a fucking all meat fitness thought who, who fucking hooks up with a human trafficker? Yeah, his daughter is like. He created one of the most evil women in yeah. the world. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, let's, let's start, let's start recording. She's the let's, dragon. Let's she's start recording. She's demonic evil. Like, she's on uh, like, evil feminine uh, trait. Uh, like, luring yeah. you with uh, luring you with Instagram picture so that you will just eat raw meat yeah. until your organs are stolen by her boyfriend who has a warehouse full of Croatian cam girls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I mean, like, it's just like... It, 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 and all of the advice to like suffering young men seemed to do him absolutely no yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. When his yeah. daughter, the uh, the whore of Babylon, and the the red great red dragon decided to abduct him <laughs> into like a an organ factoring, uh, like an organ stealing factory in Russia, and then just leave his comatose COVID ridden body in Serbia. <laughs> yeah. Like, what is what, dude? You know, I just like honestly, like, like he's he's spent the last eighteen months in like the decommissioned prison that they executed citizen X in. (laughs) (laughs) Just withdrawing from benzos in a fetal position, whimpering and shaking while his daughter, like, yeah, again, one of the most evil women ever. Oh man. It's just like, it's like, like, it's like the representation uh, of everything he writes about. She's the cult. She's the chaos dragon. Yeah. Yeah. His dragon daughter, who like working in concert with like a a thirteen and ten former MMA fighter who like now, now like yeah finds women in Zagreb and is like can you jack off on camp for me <laughs> uh, like it's you know clean your own backyard first take care of the own 
the evil women in your own life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or, or how about, or how about and, and it's like it's like none of what he suggests people do would have worked for him. No, like if he had had a really clean room, is his daughter not going to be like, all right, go into Siberia, Bucko? Like, <laughs> she doesn't care. She's evil. How about just stand up for yourself, dude? Or just like I don't know, uh, seek medical treatment in a country that's not in you know the former Soviet Union. Yeah. What a well, nightmare. now he's going to I can't wait to see what kind of uh, home remedies she suggests for the covid. I'm sure they're all going to yeah. make hydrochloroquine well, no. look like Tylenol PM. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to do that. everything from road to wellville. Yeah. Peter said he's going to get 10 <laughs> tapes of fucking animals and drop dead. Yeah, no, as soon as he turned over his um uh, uh checking account number yeah. and routing details, uh the Russian doctors hit him in the head with a giant mallet to uh reverse the flow of virus through his uh <laughs> through his strength system. Can you imagine there is no industrialized country where it would I I would li- less want medical care from than Russians. Yeah. Oh my, yeah. Like, uh, what the fuck? No, yeah. thank you. It, no, thank you. Like, yeah. Like, was the medical school attached to like a taxi trade school? <laughs> like, no, thank you, dude. If he needs intubation, they're gonna have to use like fireplace bellows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And as and the last ditch effort is they lower him into the Chernobyl Chernobyl reactor and see what happens. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, very, what an very, all, yeah. Oh, very dark times. I mean, I just like even he doesn't deserve this shit. Even he Seriously. doesn't deserve. It. No, no brutal. one does. Yeah. This, this is, is horrible. horrible. He's he is is just like a dork who wrote a bad book. He does not deserve to be trapped in in some fucking nightmare uh, Arthur Kessler uh, fantasy in, in behind the Iron Curtain. 